very much. Um, I'm always somewhat befuddled by readings because um, I know many of you, and I know that the, of those of you who I know, I know you're smart people. Those of you who I don't know, I hope to know better after the end of tonight. Um, and you're all capable, I imagine, of reading the book on your own. However, they took away my PowerPoint projector, so reading is what you're going to get tonight. Um, and in terms of the schedule, um, what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to read, I'm going to talk a little bit about the book and read for maybe uh, 20, 30 minutes. Then we'll have questions. Uh, then I'll do signings for those of you who want signed books. And then uh, we will head to um, Gott's Roadside, just down the, um, down the uh, ferry building from here. And we can have beer, wine, milkshakes, hamburgers, whatever. So there'll be a, a group doing that afterwards. Please join us if you'd like. So my book is about phone freaks. And if you were a phone freak, that's great, and that's all you need to know. Um, but not everybody here was a phone freak. So a few words of explanation. Um, if you go back to the 1930s or the 1940s, uh, the telephone system was an intensely manual thing. Right? You probably see from old movies uh, operators plugging cords into jacks. And that was how telephone calls got made back then. And that worked really pretty well. Um, for, the, for the volume of calls they had at the time. Um, the telephone company employed about 100,000 women, and they were always women because it was inconceivable that an operator could be a man during those days. Um, they had about 100,000 of these people, but they had done the forecast. They'd run the numbers, and they knew how popular the telephone was, and they knew how popular it was going to be, and they figured by 1965 they would need a million operators. And there were two problems with that number. The first problem was that there aren't a million women in the workforce in 1965. So you know, we're screwed. What are we going to do at that point? The second problem is even if you could find a million people to be operators, the cost of paying them would just be heart stopping. So um, what to do? The answer remarkably turned out to be automation. Um, what the phone company did was they built uh, these amazing machines uh, that allowed people to dial their own long distance calls. This was a huge challenge. Um, imagine building a machine that can somehow automatically figure out how to get a call, say, from Miami, Florida to San Francisco, California, and talk to the intermediate machines, the intermediate switching machines. It needs to be able to do this all on its own. It needs to be able to automatically bill for the calls. Um, it needs to do everything, right, to put the call through. Except imagine building that machine in 1930 or 1940 when the transistor hasn't been invented, the computer hasn't been invented, right? To us today, if you're an engineer, you'd be like, well, we use computers for that. It'll be great. Didn't exist back then. What blew me away, and I didn't really realize this when I first started working on the book, is that Bell Laboratories got right to work on this problem, and they solved it. And they solved it using what Mr. Spock of Star Trek would describe as stone knives and bearskins, right? I mean, they had punch paper tape. They had metal cards with holes punched in it. You know, again, they didn't have computers. They had relays and vacuum tubes. But they built this just astonishing long-distance telephone network that allowed you to dial your own calls. That was you know, hundreds of these machines, and that was from, say, 1950 to about 1980. Um, they were, at the time, they formed the largest machine in the world. And so that's what the telephone network had become. It had gone from this manual thing with cords and operators plugging, plugging cords into jacks to this amazing machine. But it was around 1955, 1960, that the telephone network started attracting some kind of unwanted attention. Um, it was attention mostly from uh, teenagers, some of them were blind, who started looking at the network and really just started becoming interested in it, become, starting to, to play with it. Um, what they had discovered was that there were some, what an engineer today would call vulnerabilities in the network. Um, in particular, the entire network was controlled by tones. So the way these machines communicated each, with each other was just by tones, by um, these little, they were like, like touch tones. And then there was a master tone, 2600 hertz, which if you're a musician is seventh octave E, just a pure tone. That tone indicated whether the trunk lines were idle, whether uh, someone had answered the phone or not. So you've got these machines, they're playing tones to one another. The problem was that if you made a long distance call, so for example, on, you take the rotary phone on the front of the book in the 1960s or 1970s, you dial a long distance call, and right after you were done dialing, you'd hear this, these little fleeting quick tones in the background that would sound like tee 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 tee. And if you have a certain kind of brain, which I know from looking at some of the people in this audience, some of you do, you hear those tones and you wonder, what are those? How does that work? 
And if I can hear the machines making those tones, then maybe the machines can hear me if I make those tones. And it turns out you could. And so if you had, if you were good at electronics, you could make something called a blue box. And this was a, this is one from 1975, just about. Um, and it's a little tone generator. It makes tones kind of similar to, um, to touch tones. It makes the 2600 hertz noise. And it also makes these tones that sound like touch tones but aren't. And with something like this, you could control the long distance network. What does that mean? It means that you could, number one, make free phone calls. But number two, sort of more interesting, you could route your calls manually from one place to another. So say you want to call the phone next to you. Well, that's easy. You just dial the phone next to you's phone number. But what if you want to do something more challenging? Well, you could dial, you route your call, let's say, through Anchorage, Alaska, and then from Anchorage to Poughkeepsie, and then from Poughkeepsie to Portland, and you could you know, stack up this routing of calls just for the sake of doing it, just because it was an interesting thing to do, because at the end you got to you know, say hello on one phone and listen a half a second later while you heard your voice on the other phone. Um, in some cases, you could even wiretap people using this technology. Uh, so you could actually make a, you could use this, these blue boxes to wiretap a call in process. Now, fortunately for the phone company, not everybody is an electronics genius in 1960 or 1970, um, and so not everybody can make a blue box. Unfortunately for the phone company, the Quaker Oats company provided something called the Captain Crunch Boson Whistle in, bo in boxes of cereal. This is just a little plastic whistle, came for a free premium, and it turns out if you cover up one of the holes and blow, you get that 2600 hertz tone. And so if you had one of these whistles, you could then make free phone calls. So the phone freaks were the people who figured this stuff out. And it turns out, and you can read more about this in the book, there were, there were the phone freaks who were just in this for curiosity. There were the phone freaks who were in this because they, were, you know, they had wanted to call each other. Um, there were the people in the organized crime, bookmakers and the mob, who wanted to use this to avoid prosecution by the feds. There were the yippies who wanted to use this technology to stick it to the United States government because they said, well, the phone company collects long distance toll uh, taxes. And so it's a 10% tax on every long distance call. So if we teach people to make free phone calls, we're depriving the government of the money that it needs to send people off to fight and die in Vietnam. So they had all these different groups that wanted to, um, to use this technology. But the one that I really focus on, I touch on all these in the book, but the one that this book turns out to secretly be about is about curiosity. It's about the curious teenagers. Um, my book is about people being playful, about being curious, about asking questions like, you know, what happens if I do this? If I can hear these tones, what if the machines can hear me? What happens if I dial this number that's not in the phone book? Uh, what if is the theme which just permeates my book? And I'd like to share with you two stories on this theme. One of them is about a blind kid named Joe Ingressia uh, who was, um, well, Instead of introducing him, let me, just, let me just read about Joe. Hang up the phone and leave it alone. Joe was about four years old when his mother first shouted that phrase at him. It was a shout he would hear again and again as he grew up. His mother could be forgiven for raising her voice. She tried to be supportive. She really did. But sometimes her son's obsession with the telephone was just a little much for her. And besides, the shout didn't work. Joe soon turned the phrase into a little song, one he would sing over and over again to himself in a quiet, lilting voice. Hang up the phone and leave it alone. Hang up the phone and leave it alone. Joe was born in 1949. His given name was Joseph Carl Ingressia Jr., but his family called him Jojo. His mom, Esther, stayed at home and took care of Jojo and his sister, Tony. Dad, Joe Sr., was a high school yearbook photographer. Though they struggled financially, they lived in a small but serviceable apartment in Richmond, Virginia. They had a car. They had a dog. In many ways, the Ingressias appeared to be a stereotypical post-war baby boom family. But as we know, appearances can be deceiving. First, there was the blindness. Joe was born blind, as was his sister. The doctors didn't know what caused it for either of them. It cannot have been an easy thing for Esther and Joe Sr. having two blind children. Any parent will tell you that having kids isn't easy. Having two blind kids is much harder. The sort of harder that makes for stress, for anger, for fighting. I won't lie to you, says Tony, 
parents fought a lot.